Uh, I have a posse, it's just not Brad Mitchell. I got a, I got a posse here, I'm gonna turn this way. Cause like I, I, this is my, always my favorite thing to do uh, is just to talk to you guys and every panel I've ever done this with, I, I tell them they're not there, they're not here. We're just having a conversation over the kitchen table and so deeply appreciate you guys coming to this. Um, as we've talked in prepping for the uh, conversation, uh, some of the main themes I think we wanna talk about, which uh, were uh, set up so well yesterday, particularly by Taylor, uh, a former student from the areas you come from, um, and talking and, and Sweeney as well as well as Ron Berger uh, and uh, Kim Alexander who sp spoke yesterday about the connection between people, place, and purpose and moving forward. And so just to start off, if we could just go Sarah on down. Um, if you could say who you are, what grade you're in, where you're from, and just give a brief little description of where you're from and then we'll get into projects and stuff like that. So Sarah, who are you? Oh, yeah, let's make sure that works. Oh, yeah. Testing, testing. Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Sarah Belcher. I am from Pikeville Independent. I'm a junior in high school, and I'm from the town of Pikeville, Kentucky. Um, we're a smaller town. We've got only about 7,000 people, and we were founded from coal mining. We are the state and nation's energy capital of the world, you'll see here. Um, so that's where I'm from. I'll Howdy y'all, my name is Gavin Couture. I'm a senior from Ashland Independent School District and I'm from Ashland, Kentucky, as you can tell by the school name. Um, we were a booming town in the 50s and 60s and then as uh, Armco and Marathon Petroleum kind of pulled out, so did a lot of the jobs, but uh, as you'll excuse me, as you'll soon hear, a lot of those are really coming back and not necessarily from those same companies, but there's a lot of entrepreneurial starts and a lot of people who want to make our community extremely better. Good morning, everybody. I'm Abby Oliver and I'm a senior at Asley County High School, which is in a small town in eastern Kentucky called Boonville. So in our community, a lots of people have to leave to go find work, and we look for a lot of economic growth in the future. So hopefully we will be able to find that with the futures of our students. Hello, I'm Caleb Ashley. I'm from Harlan County High School in Harlan County. And um, our community was once a coal-driven community that has since went away in the recent years. Great, so um, we're gonna do one more round robin and then it's gonna be kind of free exchange. So as we talked about, each of you have been involved in some community-based projects uh, that are very important to the future of your communities. Um, and uh, again, Taylor and others talking about yesterday about how providing that experience can be so helpful, not only for the children involved, but for the communities and having that tight connection. So each of you have been involved in some projects that have made a difference. If you could just talk a little bit about those projects and we'll start again with you, Sarah. Okay, so I was involved my freshman year in a project called the Empty Chair. It started as a hackathon to help combat the opioid crisis. Our county is the sixth worst in the state of Kentucky for um, drug-related drug deaths. So we really struggle with that. So what we did is we created a website and app, and it had, was a central location. People could just go and they could get information from places that could help them out of drug addiction that were already set up in our community. And we also have a lot of education programs in our school now, so we can get to the students early on before they start this. Yeah, before you move on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have follow-up questions on this. So, hacking opioid, just the phrase itself is just fascinating uh, about it. Uh, some people would say, geez, uh, that's a terrible issue, and yet you are tackling it with your colleagues. A lot of other kids uh, and people might say, I just gotta get out of here. What, what is it in the mindset where you guys have said to yourselves that's part of the community and we want to own it and try to overcome it? Why do you do that? Why don't you just leave? Well, I love my community. I've been raised in Pipeville. My family's been there for generations. I love Eastern Kentucky. And if we don't start trying to do something to solve the problem, who's going to? And if we don't start small, how can we make it big? So trying to start that at a young age and trying to get that out there to go ahead and influence before it gets worse. Uh, I am from the Ashland Independent School District and a large issue that we've had is student homelessness and hunger. And so last year I joined the Student Senate and we applied for KVEX Community Challenge Grant to be able to make our community a better place. And we had this old box truck and so we had the idea, 
to turn that box truck into a fully functional food truck to be able to bring resources to the students who couldn't come to places that were already existing to help them out because they didn't have the transportation to get there. So we figured instead of making them come to it, we would bring it to them. So using the KVEC Community Challenge Grant, as well as donations from local businesses, we turned an old, honestly ratty looking box truck that our summer feed program had been using into a fully functional food truck. It looks really, really great now. It has a full vehicle wrap that makes it very identifiable as our own district, so students obviously know it's safe. You can come and receive help from us. We, last year, put in the equipment to be able to make and prepare cold food on site. And this year, we have reapplied for the grant to be able to prepare and serve hot food on site. So it's essentially a fully functional food truck at this point. Wow. Food truck's going to be out for lunch, by the way. No, I'm kidding. That would be great. Wouldn't it be cool, woman? Um, you kept saying we. Could you just give a little meat to the bone of who were the we and what role did the students play? And was there much adults or was it we? Was student led? Tell us about the process to get to this. Uh, I'm a part of the KVAC Student Senate, which is how we were originally, we originally found out about this grant. Last year, I was the junior senator. And then Cassie Stevens, who's a very dear friend of mine now, she was the senior senator. And we were led by right there. Her name is Kelly Heishman. Wave, Kelly. She's awesome. We love her so much. Uh, she's our student agency lead with KVEC. And so that we was us, and we were kind of the hub for the center, but we brought the entire community in on it. Uh, the original, some of the original construction that was done on this tr the truck was done by our school's construction technology program. We had uh, last year for the KVEC. Senate, uh, excuse me, the fire summit, we had the culinary classes prepare some food that we could serve from it when we were showing the truck off. Uh, many, many businesses donated money to be able to help with the truck. And then uh, a man by the name of Kenny, who works at Lighthouse Collisions, which is a local auto repair shop, he was the one who did most of the construction on it. So you brought up a couple of things, if you, and any of you can jump in on this one, because KVEC and creating this ecosystem or support for student empowerment, you mentioned two in particular, which let's just tease it out a bit more. Um, what is the Student Senate, and, and how was it created, do you know? And, and if you don't know, does anybody, what is the KVEC Student Senate? Well, uh, it's a collection of all of, the, all of the counties that are involved in KVEC. In the, each of the high schools in the counties, they send a junior and a senior representative. Okay. And so they are who make up the student senate. And they are designed to be leaders in their school and to be able to make their school a better place. And so each one of those uh, two student teams takes on a project in their high school to make it a better place, to make it a better place for uh, an enjoyable education, make it not feel, I know a lot of students feel like school is a prison, so make it not feel like a prison. Make it enjoyable, make it fun, uh, do something to be able to help out their school or their community. Great, there are some days where maybe the KVEC Senate could take over the regular Senate, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Abby. So one project that has really affected me as a student has been our farm to table project at OCHS. Being the FFA president of my chapter and the Kentucky River Region FFA secretary, it's very important to me that students are very educated in the field of agriculture because not only will they get a better understanding of where their food comes from, but they'll get an insight into tons of careers and tons of hobbies that they might not have had previously. So with this project, we have a three or four acre farm at OCHS and our students are able to grow crops on the farm and we can sell those at the local farmer's market and we will get a profit from that that we can use towards our FFA chapter. And we also use the produce that we've grown, such as our pumpkins, to host events for the elementary school. Like we've done a hay ride recently and each student were able to take home a pumpkin. And then alongside this, we've been rebranding Owsley County. And this is more of a school and district wide initiative. And through this project, we want to shed a new light on the more positive aspects of Owsley County and draw away from the negative 
things that's going on in our community. And through this, we hope to just boost the overall student and community morale and bring in new economical opportunities for our community. So, you know, I'm old, well, I'm, I'm very old. Um, uh, and I'm thinking when I was your age, I'm not sure I often thought, geez, I'm gonna go to school and I wanna do something positive for our community. I was trying to think, will anyone go to prom with me? Um, um, and, and so why is that so important to you, Abby, to take on these uh, projects that will lead to a more positive image? Why is that important? Well, in my school, the student morale is pretty low, and I just feel like if we give these students something more positive to look forward to each day coming into school, then that will just boost their confidence and boost their drive towards the future to make our community better, because students are the future of our community, and if we want our community to be just overall better, we need our students to have that same drive and to have that same passion to make our community better. Okay. Okay. Caleb? Uh, the major project I've been involved with um, was also through KVEC. We developed it last year when I was the junior student senator and we're continuing it this year. It's called the CHAR Project. It stands for Community Homes for Homelessness and Addiction Recovery. And we are creating a tiny home subdivision for drug rehab graduates and then also a place for homeless students to be able to stay so they have a place uh, year round so they don't have to uh, worry about where they're going to go that night and can focus more on their education. And Taylor, I talked a little bit about the tiny home stuff. Could you put a little more meat on the bone about what, how, how do you create a tiny home? What does it take? Uh, so a tiny home, um, there is, through KVEC, there are tiny home grants. And if I'm not mistaken, there are seven this year, seven school districts that are building a tiny home. And at the end of the year, they auction them off. And then also we have local nonprofits that are constructing a tiny home. So what happens is first there's a trailer of the standard size is like eight feet by 24 feet. And they construct a fully functional home for one or like a mother and daughter, for, so two people. And it has all the uh, functions of a normal house just in a compact area. So it has a working kitchen, a fully functional bathroom, and usually like it has power and water, everything that you need to survive without the extra space. So I gotta admit, it's like <laughs> I mean, when you think of these projects, hacking opioids stuff, uh, agriculture farm to table stuff, feeding the homeless, uh, tiny houses and for, for again the homeless, you're talking about arguably four of the biggest issues a lot of rural places face. We're talking about wellness. We're talking about economic viability. Uh, we're talking about uh, regenerating economy, particularly the agricultural economy. Um, and you're doing it now at your age. Are you aware of this? Or is this more just kind of like, oh, it's a project, it's cool, and you know, it helps me get to college. Um, and that's an open conversation. I mean, from my point of view, I'm thinking, wow. But from your point of view, are you aware of the ripple effect of all this? And how are you aware of the ripple effect? Gavin, I can tell you want to talk. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Well, um, I suppose you could say I'm, I'm aware of it. It's definitely be, been an eye-opening experience for me. I didn't, when I started the project last year, I was incredibly shocked to find that 12% of our school district are classified as homeless. Like They don't have a permanent residence to stay in. That's 371 students who don't have a, a definitive home to go home to. They're in a car or in a motel, et cetera. And um, so this project, I've, I've been very appreciative of the opportunity to be able to work on it. And it's not, at this point, just a way for me to get into college. It's something that's very near and dear to my heart at this point, and I'm incredibly excited to be able to continue to work on it this year. Okay. Any other reactions to, do you understand the bigger picture of what all this is happening, beyond just looking good on your resume? Um, I definitely do think it is something different than a lot of high school students will get involved in. I think the main difference with us is we just try to avoid the fear factor and not pay attention to that and go ahead and do it anyway. Um, but it's definitely, you can see the ripple effect. When you do something, you're able to get more students involved with it. Um, I know from our empty chair project that we did, 
even though it was just four students and a teacher starting it out, we've carried it on through a mentor program with seventh graders and the high schoolers, and now you've got a whole seventh grade class plus about 20 to 30 kids who are helping them. So it gives more leadership opportunities for other kids. And it just starts with a few people. So you brought up something we talked about yesterday, fear factor, and let's start with you, Caleb. What is this fear factor with the kids that may not be grabbing these opportunities and why do you think that's there? And You guys talked a lot yesterday about the fear factor. Um, so like, there is a stigma placed on failure. So uh, in our area and across the world, failure is seen as you doing something wrong instead of you taking an educated risk that does not work out. So students, when they fail, they're, um, if they're downgraded or um, people are like, oh, they messed up, what did they do wrong? And so they're scared to take other educated risk. So if, uh, if you can lower the stigma on failure and make it seem like a risk that just something happened and it didn't work out and it's not necessarily that student's fault, a lot more students would take the educated risk and I feel like a lot of uh, good initiatives would become of that. Abby, you were shaking your head. You want to add to that? Yeah, so especially since I've been in FFA, I've got to notice so many students who just, they don't want to go out of the comfort zone and they don't want to go take a new risk because they're scared they're going to fail. And um, I think it's very important that both us as students and the educators take the risk with ourselves and motivate these students to do better and to do their best and to go out and try new things because they never know they could be fantastic at it. But without taking that risk, they'll never truly know. Did you want to add? Uh, I certainly agree. There's, especially in Appalachia, there's a, a ginormous stigma placed on failure. And um, I feel that that has been pushed down generation to generation. And so we have this whole generation of creative kids, but they're being held back because their parents and grandparents are saying, yeah, you might be able to do that, but what if you fail? You, it's not a risk worth taking. And I think that if we kind of bring that back, uh, reduce the, if we could somehow reduce the stigma, then there would, like Caleb said, be a huge amount of initiatives that would show up after that because we have some incredibly talented people. And so what I hear you saying is that part of the creation of the, of the culture of educated risk is not just the press for tests and standardized testing that can create a risk. But you're also talking about perhaps some cultural norms that says don't take the risk. And you in particular were talking about what you want to do next and how some people have said you're crazy uh, stuff. Tell people what you're thinking about doing next in your life after you graduate and well, how it's been received. After I graduate, I'd like to go and major in biology with a focus on veterinary sciences. After that, go on to vet school and I'd like to be a large animal veterinarian. And so I was working as a landscaper two summers ago because I was 15 and he was the only guy who would hire me and I needed money because, you know, I was about to turn 16 and I wanted to get a, a car. So <laughs> I'm working there and I was working for this one lady. She had a beautiful horse farm and she had horses. It was a gorgeous property. We were driving up through the hills and all of a sudden it just all cleared out and there were rolling hills all along the top of this ridge and she had horses and a beautiful house. And we were in charge of her landscaping. So I was doing some work. I was pulling weeds because I was the young guy. I got the chore of getting down on my hands and knees and pulling weeds all day long. So that was a wonderful time. But as I was pulling weeds, she came over and she talked to me. And she asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I explained that I wanted to be a large animal veterinarian. And she kind of stopped. And she thought about it. And that fear, that stigma against failure, it came up. And this was the first time that I had really seen that. And she said, you realize how much money that you'd have to put in for that? And I was like, yeah, it'd be a big investment, but it'd be an investment in my future. And she said, well, I recognize that, but what if you fail? What if you don't make it into vet school and all that was for nothing? And I said, I'm not gonna think about that because I'm gonna make it happen. It's, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna be a large animal veterinarian. I, I can feel it. And she said, well, I'm glad you feel that way because we need a large animal veterinarian around here. The closest thing I have, if one of my horses gets hurt, he's 45 minutes away. And that would require me packing my horse up in the trailer, which would be a two hour process for an injured horse, and then driving that 
45 minutes away. So the same woman who needed that here, who needed that service, I, ha I would have a niche here in Ashland, she was the one who pushed me away and said, that's not worth it. And yet you persevere. Yes, sir. And when I asked you yesterday, uh, when you go away and come back with a vet degree, that you want to come back. I do. And do your reasons you want to come back are? Uh, well, like, like the woman said, there's, there's nothing like that around here. So it would give me a, uh, a niche to be able to set up my own practice and be able to have my own practice there in Ashland, be able to take care of all of the horses and cows and other livestock around the area. People, purpose, place coming together. Abby, what are you going to be doing next? Well, I would like to attend Eastern Kentucky University and major in social work. And after that, I would really like to attend law school and become a lawyer because that's just my dream job. And as far as if I want to stay in Asley County, that's still kind of undecided because like I mentioned, we don't have very many economic opportunities in Asley County, but what that's going to take is these young students coming back to Asley County and bringing their field of work into our area. Caleb, your future? Um, I'm uh, hoping to attend Moorhead State University and majoring in biomedical sciences in hope of going into the medical field and becoming a radiologist. And I too would like to come back to my area. Not, I don't know if it'll be exactly the county where I live now, but definitely Eastern Kentucky. There's just something about the culture and the people in Eastern Kentucky that it feels like home. But uh, the main reason I want to come back to Eastern Kentucky is because there is not the, uh, in radiology, there's not the the people for the demand that the field requires. So in our local hospital, one radiologist is shared by five hospitals. So they are, they go from place to place. So they're um, on average at each hospital one day a week. So if you aren't uh, at the hospital the day that you have your CAT scan or your MRI done, it makes it hard. Um, so you're losing economy when they have to send that scan to another um, person outside of our area so we're losing money from the economy for having to pay someone outside and it's just um, taking people away from our area to solve our problems when we can solve them ourselves. We're gonna get to you but before we do again I'm reflecting on my own misplaced youth. Um, I'm sure I'm not sure I knew what a radiologist was at 18 but beyond that I mean you just did a description of the local labor market and that analytics and the supply and demand. How, how do you know that? Uh, I don't know. I just kind of, I'm a wealth of useless knowledge, so. No, no, it's completely the opposite. It's very practical and useful knowledge. I mean, you know about that five different hospitals. Do you know about the nature of the day, the nature of the job, the income? And like when I and like uh, when I care about something or inspired by something, I do a little too much research sometimes, so that helps. <laughs> Okay. What are you going to be doing next? Um, well, they're all mentioning their colleges. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to go wherever I get the best scholarship. Um, <laughs> but I am looking into going into the medical field. As far as coming back to the region, I'm not sure. I'll depend on the opportunity there. I know I love the region and I want to help them out. But right now I'm thinking family practice for dermatology probably. And just to tease that out a bit, uh, why do you love the region? What is it about the region you love? Really, pretty much all of it. I love the culture. It's honestly, if you go to Eastern Kentucky, the Appalachian Mountains, they do not get enough credit, but it's one of the most beautiful areas you will ever see. You can go up to Pine Mountain, and it is just as pretty as when you go to Tennessee and around Knoxville, all that area. The people are amazing. It's one of a kind, down to earth folks, especially where I'm from. I'm from a small town called Dorton. It's really close to the Virginia line, but people are just, they're, it's that southern hospitality, it's uh -huh. home, and it's where I've raised, been raised and have come to love, so. So going back to hacking opioids, that love for place, you want to be part of helping that place continue to have the best part of that place as, real, as revitalize itself and the issues it's facing. Yes, sir. Because of that love of place. Mm -hmm. All right, that's beautiful. Um, have I done, I've done all of you on that one. Um, Abby? I want to go to you and, um, and ask you about uh, the sense of place a little bit more um, and tied back to your projects. And again, I'm going to ask all of you, but you're doing, be, being, doing these projects, 
did it affect your trajectory of where you're going to go? Did it change your point of view about what's next because of having that experience with these projects? Yes, yeah, so I definitely feel like that's impacted where I want my future to go because before I got super involved with the school and the community, I always had this mindset of I want to leave Eastern Kentucky, I want to get out of here, I want to get away from the small town stigma. But after I've been involved with these projects and I've got to meet so many amazing people from our area, I've kind of realized that all of these great things about the big city can be found right in Eastern Kentucky, right in the small towns. And also, I want to continue to impact our communities in a positive way and bring a positive change into Asley County and into Appalachia. All right. Uh, I'm a professional facilitator, so you hand this to Gavin. Okay. And, but we're going to go to you first, see how, and then you'll be ready. Um, the experience with the project, how has it impacted your trajectory of your life? Um, so I feel like the, um, where I work with the drug rehab graduates and homeless students is a problem that's overshadowed. So from the outsider perspective, it's something that people want to cover up to not show because they say it's a negative um, drug addiction. Um, that's, just, that's just that group of people. They're just going to stay and they're going to relapse after their rehab and it's just going to be a cycle and they want to cover it up so people in the outside world can't see. Well, there's people who are struggling with addiction and that's leading to students being homeless. But when you actually get in and get to like looking at the problem and the root of the problem, it's actually a problem that is solvable with just a little bit of work if you can just take over the cover and make it actually known. Because a lot of people don't even know about how much of an issue it is. Gavin, how's the project shaped your life? I think kind of like Caleb said, it's kind of, it's entirely shaped my awareness of an issue that I had no idea existed, like I've previously said. I mean, uh, if you look at the hierarchy of needs, we're there towards the bottom. Like, you, you have to have food. It's incredibly important. It's life-sustaining. And that's, the issue is just something that I didn't realize was an issue until I actually got down and I looked in it. Mm. And... It's incredibly disturbing to see how just how extensive this issue is. And so it's entirely shaped my awareness in my entire community. And Sarah? Um, I definitely think these projects have shaped how I think on the community and getting to see. I didn't really realize how much of a problem this was. Um, I come from a very sheltered home, very blessed to be able to not have seen a lot of this. But getting to talk to people as we went through, I got to talk with the project, people who had been struggling with addiction, the people thought had no hope and they came out of it. My own teacher who was over it, her son, when they moved to the area, he got addicted to opioids and nearly died because of it. But he's now came out of it, he's in remission. Um, so definitely getting to see a different aspect of the life. That is a big problem in our community. It's a big part right now. But trying to come up with something to solve it and make it better. I, you know, again, uh, um, I'm thinking our KVIC colleagues have set me up. I think you're actually young-looking 38-year-old people <laughs> that have mortgages and stuff like that. I know. I just, I just, I just uh, blown away. Okay, I want to do. I'm, we're now comfortable, right? And you know, I'm, I'm going to do a little surprise. And you know, it's okay. Happy, it's okay. Um, um, there is a, a report that came out uh, sponsored by the 4-H and uh, the bridge band group about social mobility in rural America. And they asked the question, where are the rural communities in America that are really increasing mobility, both income mobility and, and lifestyle and quality of life stuff? Um, and big data sort. Um, and they came out with, in the communities that are really turning it around. Uh, they identified, we're not gonna do all six, so it's okay. They identified six things that those communities do. And so I'm going to give you a topic, and the first thing I'm going to do is you're going to go, totally agree, not sure, nah, that doesn't fit my reality. Got it? So we're all going to do this. Got it. Very good, sir. <laughs> yes, good. All right. Uh, number one is, does your community expect all young people to participate and stay engaged in the life of the community? All right. So we'll go positive first. Why, uh, why do you believe that's so? Um, I definitely think, especially at my school, students are encouraged to become part of the community. 
We do a lot of volunteer work, a lot of volunteer programs. Actually, our most participated in extracurricular, there's over 100 members, is community service. It's called Teens Who Care United, partner with Unite Club on that. And we definitely try to get students more involved in the community. Um, I'm also part of the volunteer organization at my hospital. And you get to see a lot of kids trying to help out the community in that way from a very young age, trying to get in there, so. You guys were kind of going that way. And again, it doesn't have to be round robin, whoever wants to speak. Why, why is it that way? You don't see a lot of your community saying, this is an expectation for all our kids. Um, I think certainly in the past, and this is somewhat changing now, we are, high school just recently got a new principal and he did in fact say that he wanted to see 100% student involvement in extracurriculars okay. and that's grown but still I mean a lot of people they're not they don't want to do something like that that's not really something that appeals to them and so and then I mean extracurriculars but then there's even less actually directly involved in things that are community not just school based right. either one of you guys want to play so my answer is kind of similar to Gavin's in the sense of students just don't have a passion within our school that they can follow and some students just haven't tried anything new and they've not tried to step out and find something new. Like myself, I never thought that I would love FFA the way that I do, but I stepped out of my comfort zone and I tried it and I really enjoy it and it's just absolutely the best thing that's came out of my high school career. And I just feel like both students and teachers lack that motivation to go out and find something new and to go out and pursue new extracurricular activities in both the school and the community. Uh, like Gavin and Abby both said, the lack of opportunity uh, makes it hard. Deep down, every student, regardless if they act like it or not, there is something that they are passionate about. Everybody has something that they deeply care about, and it's just about uncovering that and giving them the opportunity to participate in an organization or something about that they're passionate about. And if they have that opportunity, I feel like that the extracurricular um, percentages would grow and everything would be, um, people would have a lot more things to do in that area. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to get optimistic here in a second, but let's also get real. Um, so we were talking, and I was out yesterday, KVAC did a reception, and we had a lot of student projects out just side the hallway. Um, and one of the student projects was around vaping and the growth in vaping. And when I was talking to those kids, and then when I talked to you this morning, you guys kind of confirmed it. Uh, a lot of those uh, kids were saying, um, yeah, it's great, but we're actually getting shunned. Uh, by our either fellow kids saying, hey, don't be, don't be a party buster. But also they were sharing stories that community members, parents, were on Facebook and saying, you know, stop doing this. Um, how do you react to that and what does that mean? Go ahead. Okay. We're getting, we're getting real here. <laughs> part of this. Um. Well, definitely, I think, and here recently it's gotten better because you are starting to see some of the effects of vaping and things like this, popcorn lung, just different things in the community. But definitely when it first started, there was a lot of opposition to it. Like, for instance, I did KYA, Kentucky Youth Assembly, and we made a vaping bill. And we go in there, they have the little setup house. It's kind of like the real state government. You try to get your bill passed, so we get up there and we're talking about all the stuff to prevent vaping. I've never heard more nays from teenagers in my life. Like it got voted down terribly because a lot of the teenagers there, even though this is supposed to be some of your top kids, were vaping already at such a young age. And so it's definitely been a problem and something that people aren't wanting to go against quite yet, but I do think that is changing because of the consequences they're seeing. And I just want to emphasize the courage of the leadership, both at the student level um, and the issue that if we just would get out of your way sometimes, the adults can be part of the issue here too in terms, but there are a lot of strong things with the positive things. So let's talk about the positive things and I, we talked at the table about this. Um, uh, Patel for Kids and Ed Leader 21 uh, in particular are, are working on developing portraits of a graduate, community-based portraits of graduate in which the community can reclaim its narrative and reclaim its future by saying, this is the type of, 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 of next generation qualities and skills and characteristics far beyond test scores. 
Do you think a portrait of a graduate approach would help some rural communities wrestle with the dilemma we just talked about in terms of fear of failure, in terms of, of the shunning things that can sometimes take place, and help community members reclaim uh, their own destiny? I, I certainly think that uh, if our communities, especially if my high school, and we've, uh, my high school has been absolutely fantastic about putting out some wonderful graduates. I was friends with a large portion of this past graduating class, and they were all incredible people. But that's not to say that they didn't have some of their flaws. Um, but uh, We all have flaws. I, I certainly think that if our communities as a whole were to focus on particular issues that we find in these young people who we want to be going off to college or trade school to be able to better our communities, and if we were to be able to find something in them that we could better, uh, find something that, that maybe isn't quite up to standard, that they wouldn't be uh, great at in the real world and be able to change that, some real world application stuff, yeah. then they would be better for it coming out of high school. And yesterday you said something that blew my mind. When I asked a similar question, you said, when I asked you what could schools do, and, and you said, provide experience so that we can reach our full potential. What did you mean by that? Well, um, I'm a part of our school's biomedical track. So as a freshman, you're in a class, and it's called biomedical sciences. And as you progress through your four years of high school, there are four different um, classes, and each one builds off of each other. And your junior and your senior year, you're allowed to go and shadow at King's Daughters Medical Center, which is our local hospital. And so you get, I've got to shadow in the uh, emergency room, in the EKGs, and several other places around the hospital. And it's incredibly interesting. But while I was there, it kind of confirmed that I don't want to work with humans. I'd rather work with animals. <laughs> Because, you know, animals can't talk back. Two plus two. But, um, so if you could provide that experience so that people in high school can know kind of what they want to do, yeah. then that means that they'll have better opportunities in college. Because someone who doesn't have the money for college isn't going to go to college for nothing if they know what they want to be, if they have aspirations to be an astronomer or something like, like that, then they'll know what they want to do. If they want to be an engineer, then they know to look for an engineering school. But if they have no idea what they want to do with their life, then why in the world would they go to college when they could figure that out at home for free? So if we could provide that experience to students and get them understanding what they want with their lives, then I think that we would start seeing uh, larger numbers of students either going to college or going to trade school to be able to better our communities. Yeah, and I know you're into the large animal thing, but if you shift, man, education's a wonderful profession. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful profession. Anything else about the possibility of portraits helping and supporting good things happening in rural America? Yeah, I feel like if more schools just develop the portrait of a graduate um, idea, that that would give both educators and students a better guideline to go by for how they want to educate their students and what they want to give them a perspective into the real world with. And like Gavin said, that'll give them a better perspective of the real world and where they want their futures to go. Like my school has been working on developing the portrait of a graduate and um, I got to partake in one of the meetings that they had about that. And I feel like just the conversations they had was guiding our school into the right direction of where they want the futures of their students to go. Great. All right, back to the list. Uh, for the group, I'm gonna read the whole list and then it's only the last one I want the thumbs up on. But I think it's a nice list, and I think you've talked about many things. Uh, the second one is, what support systems are we providing to our youth and which are most needed? And you kind of talked about the various projects and stuff. Third, are we imbuing our young people with a sense of possibility and helping them plan accordingly toward a better life? You've talked about that. Are we providing a wide array of opportunities to build life skills? What actions are we taking to extend access to resources and opportunities to all our people, regardless of their income, race, religion, or location? Okay, the last one is the one I want the thumbs up, thumbs down on. 
what steps are we as a community taking to build the demand side of economic opportunity? Are we making our community a place where young people want to remain or return uh, if they do leave? How are we on that? All right, we'll go with the positive first. Why, do you, why did you say that, yeah, it's thumbs up, we're working on the demand side, making your community a place where young people want to remain and return if they leave? Uh, in our area, uh, we have a, an association called Ashland Alliance, and it's a collection of businesses, and they have an office, like a headquarters, that kind of oversees all of them, and it's, it's an alliance of businesses. And so it's a large part of the lawmaking process in Ashland, and it's, it's comprised of some of like the, not necessarily the most important people, but people who have great amounts of pull who really care about our community. Right. And they created a program called Youth Leadership. And it takes five different school districts, so Ashland Independent, Green Up, Raceland, Russell, and it's not, it's a few others. And they all come together and the tops in the junior class, you apply when you're a sophomore and you have to write an essay and it's a blind application process. And you continue, when, if you're accepted, then once a month you get out of school for the day and you go and you look at a different, um, different area in your community that the community is working on building that you know, when you come back you can be able to work on. And I enjoyed it so much last year that I've come back this past year, my senior year, and I have been working as the senior representative. So three seniors come back and they kind of help with the whole process. But this past month in October, we, no, September, excuse me, we, they did the very first um, meeting and so everyone got out of school and we met at the local mall and we went and we looked at different entrepreneurs that have opened up places around our community. And it's even grown since last year when we went. And so uh, it really opened up the student size and my eyes, I saw it all last year, but it continued to grow since last year and I've seen things that I didn't see last year. And so they just showed all of the students this entrepreneurial process that many, many people have taken up in our community. And uh, Winchester, which is the main drag through downtown, has, uh, it, the business side of it has grown. We now have a up and coming hotel with a very fancy restaurant in it. It's delicious. We went for homecoming. Uh, <laughs> what did you have? <laughs> um, Kidding. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, it has a new guitar shop. The guy makes his own guitars and sells them. It's, it was really, really cool. Uh, a, a new upcoming pharmacy and several other things that have just opened right. in this past year. And so they really show the students that if you want to, this, there's an area here for business. Right. There are jobs here that have not been shown to you, but they're definitely here. And if you come back after college, you can make this place even better. So I'm not going to ask you guys who are in the middle because I'm going to just try to remind you of something about 35 minutes ago. The only question I asked where we got kind of the Bambi and the headlights look was when I asked you, do you realize the ripple effect the projects had? And you all kind of went, huh? When you think about the opioid, opioid stuff, when you think about the food truck, when you think about the farmer's market, when you think about the tiny houses, those are all going to be businesses in your communities that will make places coming Better. So what you've done in high school is actually creating the community for tomorrow. And so I just want to applaud you for taking that out. Um, couple final questions. So the last question, this was what we call the drop mic moment. Um, and uh, we'll go by who wants to go first, but you're all going to do this. I asked you, as you know, uh, if you could look at this vast array of researchers and policymakers and ed leaders and practitioners and people we don't know uh, are in this audience. Um, what's the one piece of advice you would give them uh, about the future of rural education, the future of rural communities, and you had a night to think about it? Who'd like to go first? Or I was just pick somebody. Okay, Sarah, you're going to okay. go first. <laughs> um, 
definitely encourage your students to get more involved with things like this. I know we've talked about the fear factor a lot, but just showing these students you can do it, when you tell the students and have these expectations of you can go farther, they're going to try to meet those. They want to please you all. And so <laughs> they do. And so definitely trying to get them more involved right now, show them what they've already done, how much, because we have come very far in rural education here in recent years, show them what can be done to bring it even farther, what they can do to help with that. And just that even though these things are scary at first, you can start small and it can become more rewarding. I, I would say building on to something I've said today, provide that opportunity for your students and encourage them to take that leap because like we've all mentioned, there's an incredibly underlying tone of that it's a fear of failure. And that's been passed down from generation to generation. But if we can get rid of that and tell, like Sarah said, the students, you got this. I believe in you, if you don't make it, figure out what you did wrong and try it again. Uh, and that's not only going to uh, make their futures brighter and give them more opportunity, but it brightens the future for your entire community. I think that if both educators and students go out and find something they're passionate about and they share that with the community and within their school district, that this will bring more opportunity for the students to just learn from and build from and you know encourage future generations to go out and make their school district and their community better and just bring more to the table for the future leaders of both our area and our country. Like all three of them said, uh, the increase of opportunity will make um, the world and our area change, but it starts with the teachers and teachers are being pressured um, through st standardized testing. Most of their, um, how they're assessed as a teacher comes from one single or a couple standardized tests. So it makes it harder for them to be able to provide the opportunity for the students to branch out instead of them focusing on an end of the year test that is how they are assessed, if they are a good teacher or not. So if we can lessen the pressure on the standardized test and more of um, what the students are able to do after taking the class, I feel like it would increase the amount of opportunity and it will take the pressure off the teachers to be able to teach more what they feel the students would um, learn from the most instead of what they need to know for the end of the year assessment. Thank you. This is the best fun I've had in a long time. Um, two final thoughts. Uh, um, one, this phrase educate at risk. Uh, for the community, for the teachers, for the students themselves. I'm actually thinking of writing an article called, you know, the future of rural schools and educated risk. Uh, because the other aspect about it is, I believe, the best parts of innovation will come from rural schools, are coming from rural schools. Um, and if we risk to ignore that and not spread that, um, the country faces a dilemma too in terms of an educated risk. So I appreciate that. Last thing I want to share, um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, NREA um, produces a, a journal called The Rural Educator, a journal about rural and small schools. Lovely stuff in it. Um, and in the summer 2019 edition, there's an article by Amy Azano and Catherine Padell, which has a quote in here. Uh, they're quoting somebody else, but it's a quote in here that um, I think is a nice way to kind of end your lovely wisdom and your collective brilliance. Um, rural schools can play several roles in helping people live well. Rural schools can play several roles in helping people live well. And that the future quality of all lives depends on raising a generation of young people to take their places as participants in a moral, communal, and democratic society. The future and quality of all of our lives depends on raising a generation of young people to take their places as participants in a moral, communal, and democratic society. I, for one, am much more confident after listening to you four that there's a possibility for this. So thank you very much. Let's give it up for this group.